And now it's time for Solo, a priest pushing story. This chapter is very strange, and given that it's based primarily around shoving, mounted units are less useful here. You can also only bring 11 people, which is pretty restrictive. So I definitely want Khalil and Soren. For some reason, Soren's down here. I might not bring Titania here, because like I said, you want shoving abilities in this chapter. Though I might actually need Jill, so... I also want to bring Lev, and in fact, I think I actually want to bring Mordecai too. So, who do I drop then? Racin is going to be useful. Uh, Gaytree is probably decent too, but... Um, I don't know, I might want to bring Mordecai here. I mean, it honestly doesn't really matter who you bring as long as they're capable of shoving, but... I want at least one Smite user here. I'll catch everyone up who I don't bring with bonus experience after this chapter because we'll actually be getting a lot of it. So I said this in the last part, but in case you didn't watch that, we have these priests here. Most of them are unarmed and aren't really going to do anything. Okay, every priest that survives is worth bonus experience, but if all the priests survive, you get a very special reward. So that's what I'm going to be going for here. Now the two bishops up here have silent staff, so you'll have to watch out for that. And the bishops over here... They actually have attacking capabilities, including Tominami, this guy, but he doesn't really have any skills. He's kind of a boss, but not really. You don't want to kill him. And he has this tendency to suicide himself if you put any ranged attackers in his range, so you want to make sure that only melee units go up in the central path, just to avoid the risk of Tominami dying. Now, there is one very, very easy way to end this chapter and prevent any priest from dying completely effortlessly, but it will mean that you don't get any of the treasure chests. Speaking of treasure chests, there's a thief here, so I want to take this thief out quickly, and that's partially what Meteor is for. It's also partially what Bolting is for. So on this side, there's a lot of axe users, so I'm going to be sending Stefan around that side. Leth and Mordecai are going to be going in the central path, because they'll just be shoving stuff. And that leaves... let's see... Actually, Soren might end up going around the other side. Ike's going to take the centre path. Nephany is going to actually go around here and... Yeah, it's pretty much just going to be Nephany and Khalil down this path, but they should be able to handle it all by themselves. Stefan will handle this side. And yeah, Volk will go here for the chest because I already have chest keys over here. Now, some of the enemies... yeah, this guy drops a chest key. So let's begin the chapter. Now this is a defeat boss chapter, and I forgot to introduce the boss earlier. This is Schaefer. He does have two killer weapons, so he can be a little bit scary to fight. And he has the Colossus skill, which isn't that scary, because he only has 14 weight. It's not hard to be immune to that. He's surrounded by a lot of priests and a lot of other enemies. But none of that's going to matter, because... First bolting... And now Meteor. This is why I wanted Soren to get a C rank in Fire Magic. There's actually a pretty funny strategy that some speedruns use here, which involves untrained Tormod. Because Tormod starts with a C rank in Fire Magic, so he can use Meteor right off the bat. So you Meteor the boss with Khalil, and then you trade to Tormod, and you Meteor with Tormod. Tormod can miss, though. It's, in fact, pretty likely that he'll miss. But in this run, Meteor again. And chapter over. So that was Solo. And... Yeah, nah, I'm not doing the chapter that way. Yeah, I'm going to be going for all of the chess here. Also, let's transform animation to a little while to load for the game there. But this is generally how I like to play Fire Emblem games. Even though many defeat boss maps can be cheesed quite easily, I mostly prefer to just go for getting all the chests and the like. Because it's a bit more fun to me that way. 
But yeah, if all you're concerned about is turn count, this chapter is incredibly easy. You just meteor and bolting the boss to death, and that's pretty much it. Don't have to deal with any of the priest pushing, and it means all the priests live, so you get all of the rewards out of the chapter too, apart from the chest, so... It's definitely effective, but like I said, you do miss out on these chests. Now, your evasion goes down a little bit with Elf Under, but it's probably going to be alright. Soren can be at a little bit of risk here. Actually, Stefan can be too, because there's quite a few dangerous Lance users. But usually I feel like the two of them can handle this. Also, I believe this chapter's battle um, background is pretty unique. Don't think any other chapter looks like this. I'll leave those two over there. Now, here is the annoying part. I like to lure these fighters, and in some cases some of the other enemies, like these longbow archers, down here, past these this wall of priests. But I can't lure with ranged attackers, because if I do that, then... Obviously, this guy has a chance of killing himself, and I don't want that to happen at all. So what I'm actually going to do here is... I'm just going to have Ike go, like, here. This should hopefully get rid of both of those fighters, and it should maybe lure some of these guys down too. This guy's also a little annoying to take out, and there's also that guy, but... Here's something funny that you can do with Khalil, although first, let me just, um... Oh yeah, you also need to be aware of the fact that the priests here, even though they're walls for you, since they are technically considered as part of the enemy side, they don't impede the enemy's progress, so this guy right here can run straight through the priests and get to you. I made that mistake in a practice run of this chapter. Kind of forgot that um, the priests do not count as walls to the enemy. And that was pointless, but oh well. So just clearing out a few enemies here. The annoying thing about this part is that, of course, mounted units can't shove, which means that Jill... Jill will not be able to get into this room until Nethany shoves this priest out of the way. But she can lure enemies out, out of the room down to her. Now I just need to make sure that I do not attack the priests. Thankfully, it seems to default to targeting the actual enemies and not the priests, which is good. But misclicks can be dangerous in this chapter. And that's still a cool animation. I actually really like how the spear looks in this game too. Okay, so that's you gone. There's still a few enemies here that I'll need to deal with later. I wonder if you have 18 speed and... Well, yeah, you're definitely doubling. And the Lagoo's Axe, I was worried for a second, but I don't need to be because of the Beor Guard, except... Do need to make sure that those two fighters attack Ike, but I guess I can put left there if I really want to. Volk is going to hang back for now. I don't want him getting attacked by all these fighters. Mordecai will get in position to get ready to smite some things, and Mist is going to go in the middle just, you know, so I can physic both sides of the map. Now, Khalil, there's something a little interesting that I could do with Khalil. So this sage here has a bolting tome, but Khalil doubles him with bolting, and he also drops his Bolting Tome, so I sometimes like to take him out with my own Bolting, because that effectively means I'm spending two uses of Bolting to gain five uses of Bolting. So I get three uses of Bolting out of the deal. Which is not a bad trade-off. So now I'm going to make your Tome fly all the way out of your hand and right to Khalil. Someone mentioned in comments in the last chapter that, um... The distant counter weapons in Heroes, all of them had the description user can counter attack regardless of range. Oh right, yeah, that Swordmaster. I need to watch out for that Swordmaster because he can actually move pretty far past those priests. But yeah, regardless of range, and yeah, as you can see, he's probably going to go for Mordecai, but Mordecai should be okay. Regardless of range, if that applied to games that have Siege Tomes and Ballistas, that would be pretty amusing, but... Nothing has more than two range in heroes, so that's why that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I like to lure these archers out from behind the priests, because if they stand directly behind the priests and shoot you with their longbows, then they become very annoying to shift, because then you won't be able to shove the priests, because they'll be stuck behind them, and then you won't be able to kill the archers without range attacks, but if you use range attacks, you risk Tominami killing himself. 
it's a bad situation all round, so that's why I like to lure the archers past the priest wall. And I thought that might happen, but Mordecai should be okay. So Nola pointed out that the generic enemy swordmasters look almost exactly like Navarre in this game. Yes, even a crit barely does anything. At the very least, Shadow Dragon Navarre. For some very weird reason, my sister didn't like the fact that Navarre wears red in that game. He preferred him wearing purple. I still really don't know why. But she got really upset that he doesn't wear purple anymore. Just a strange story there, but... Yeah, I don't know. To me, it just feels like it's just the generic red enemy palette on Swordmasters that just happens to look like Navarre. And a Sleep Staff. So, if I let that thief steal any more of those chests, then I'm not going to be able to get any of the items. Good news, though, is I can simply... Okay, either... Actually, no, you can't because you'll have to get past these priests. So, Jill can just fly up here and throw Zenobia at this guy, which gives me weird images. <laughs> but... And if she stays here, sure this priest won't be able to get pushed out of the way, but it means that the sniper will likely attack Jill and also get Zenobia'd. Like many, many, many unique monsters in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. For some reason I called X in a previous video. It's this weird thing that I do, I sometimes call Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Xenoblade Chronicles X. I guess because X was actually the second Xenoblade game, even though it's technically a spin-off. But anyway... Let's just take this guy out. I suppose something that I just realised with these guys' faction name being Mercenary, it fits because they're, you know, mercenaries who side with Dayan, but the other thing about that is that whenever you see fighters, warriors, or Myrmidons, or Swordmasters in... Um, like, among the Dayan army, they're always listed as Mercenary rather than Soldier. Which implies that the Dayan army generally doesn't employ those classes, they just hire them as Mercenaries. And it makes sense that mercenaries would want to work for Dayan because, you know, Dayan pays as long as um, you're strong enough. So this side, I'll need to shove this guy out of the way. I... Okay, uh, yeah, Soren is just barely enough to do that. If Soren wasn't promoted, he wouldn't be able to shove that priest, which would have been pretty funny. Uh, that second guy was not lured, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to do that now. Yeah, Tomonami doesn't really seem to move just yet. And uh, I'm not going to do that. That would be dumb. At least just doubling Swordmasters, which is kind of amusing, I guess. Yeah, actually, let's do this, because that should lure this second fighter and also the second archer. And I'm not really too worried about turns here, because I need to spend a lot of turns to get all of the chests anyway. Well, not a lot of turns, several turns, and that is just sad. Even though this is a very defense-blessed Ike, that's still very sad. But, I'll need to spend a few turns to get the chest. There are also some reinforcements that I definitely want to fight here, because they're feral ones, and are thus worth a lot of experience. And, okay, let's see. I don't want left to go there, because then this archer will be able to do the thing that I don't want him to do, and go here, and that makes things awkward, so... If she does go there, I'll actually have to race in her backwards using racing as a verb, but I guess it kind of makes sense. Because, yeah, otherwise that longbow archer is going to get into a position that I really don't want him to be in. There's a lot of enemy movement management in this chapter. Well, I mean, not really, because you can just destroy the boss with bolting, but... Ignoring that, there's a lot of enemy movement management. You need to know exactly how far the enemies can move and just... where is the right position for them to get into. And yes, whatever you do, for the love of everything, do not put any ranged attacker in Tomonami's range. He usually subscribes to the AI philosophy of don't attack people who can counterattack, but if you only have ranged attackers in his range, he will definitely kill himself. So, yeah. On my first playthrough of this game, I was unable to get the special reward from this chapter because Tomonami was the one priest who died. You also want to make sure that, um, like, if he's totally boxed in and his only option is to attack someone in melee who can counterattack, he will do that. So, do not let him get into that kind of situation. 
which, believe me, I may have had happen to me before as well. And Khalil, for now, will just, um, she might actually want to be skewed a little more towards this side, because there's going to be a Thief reinforcement over there, and I might need to bolt in him if things get too out of hand. But overall, this isn't a particularly hard chapter, it's just kind of a strange one. It's a very weird map gimmick. I wonder if the developers came up with this right when they came up with the shoving system. This is the first game to have shoving, and in fact, I kind of wonder how the developers came up with the shove system. But it's a really cool system, and I wish more games in the series had it. And yeah, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. Nice. Because now I can do the classic Zelda block pushing technique for that line of priests, including Tominami. The um, up, up, and then left or right. Dang it, I miscalculated your range. One enemy should be okay for racing. I will need to heal him, but that was pretty stupid. I shouldn't have done that. And you just went into a good position because now Nefany can shove you. And yeah, these are the feral ones that I was talking about. Ow. Yeah, you really need to get healed. They're not all that strong, but um, they do give decent experience. So Jill is going to do a hit and run on this guy. Which might not hit. Actually, wait, no, she's going to do a kill and run. I was about to say if she hits, but she actually hit both of those. Jill has come a long way since the start of the game, well, both character development-wise and the fact that she's actually hitting things now. Also, that chest key. I'm going to need to dump the vulnerary because I will need both chest keys on this side because I'm sending Volk down the other side. And now Nephany is going to equip this and then shove you. Because I didn't select attack, otherwise that would have been a pretty embarrassing way to lose the chapter. And yes, yeah, Soren can shove. And yeah, we've heard this map theme for a long time, but I still really love it. This is still one of my favourite map themes in the game. That and Grail Mercenaries, they're both really good songs. Still don't know why the English version of Smash Brothers Brawl completely um, got the names of the songs wrong. Because they use all of their Japanese names, like Against the Dark Knight, although Power Hungry Fool was the same. So I guess it's called that in both versions. And of course, Dark Knight gives people Batman flashbacks. And the Black Knight's name in Japanese was Shikoku no Kishi, which is literally pure Black Knights, but yeah, Black Knight is pretty much the best English equivalent for that. We have a bow as well. So yeah, what I was saying about the old Zelda block pushing technique is is the one on the right up, the one on the left up, and the centre one either left or right. There's so many times in the series where you have to do that. But in this case, I have to be careful when doing it with Tominami because that would mean I don't want him to get into a position where he is forced to attack someone in melee. Because obviously that doesn't end well for anyone. Khalil's actually seeing a little bit of use this run, though, which is kind of good. That's the cool thing about Khalil, she can slot into just about any team. Even if you don't plan on using her for that long, she's always pretty great. Her base stats are just enough to one-round most enemies with magic at this point, and her growths are pretty good. Her one weakness is using knives. Okay, I need to heal Raisin, though. Alright, and yeah, uh, Obviously, the other reason I brought the Restore Staff was because of all the poison weapons. I forgot there were poison weapons in this chapter because I usually don't get hit by them, but Racing was just unlucky there. But anyway... Here's why Smite doesn't really help as much in this chapter as you might think, because most of the priests are in a position where you can only shove them one space anyway. So, you're getting shoved... And then, yeah, you have to go either to the left or to the right, but... Need to make sure to get you into a position where you can't just, um... Attack someone in melee, because that would be really terrible. So if I push him into that corner, like with left here... I think he should attack left, but if he just prioritises worse resistance, then... I mean, the AI usually prioritises no counterattacks or anything else, but... Also, Volk can officially do that. 
And that sniper... Where can that sniper go? Yeah, I don't think that sniper can actually attack anyone from anywhere. But if I... I'm just trying to think, because I really don't want Tomonami to attack Mordecai and kill himself, because I'm pretty sure that's exactly how he died in my first playthrough. I'm pretty sure it was Mordecai who did that. Also need to make sure Rayson's out of range of that sniper, because that would be stupid. Okay, please don't go for Mordecai. Thank you. He usually prioritizes no counterattacks, but like I said, I have seen him be stupid before. Also, he doesn't even get a boss conversation. And again, he's not really technically a boss. I think he has special dialogue with Ike, but I don't know. In fact, I'm pretty sure he doesn't, because I've seen him attack Ike a lot in earlier runs of this chapter. I mean, more on my own time than, um, actually. Yeah, so the funny thing is, uh, just guess a little bit of an insight into my methods here. I usually practice recording segments before I actually record them, but I haven't really needed to practice Path of Radiance much, because one, I've already played this game many, many times. Um, I've actually unlocked most of the bonus characters, that's how many times I've played it, though I'm still nowhere close to unlocking the final bonus character, whose unlock requirements are just stupid. But also the fact that this game's very easy at this point. I've said it before, but I do think Path of Radiant is an easier game than Sacred Stones, and I've already said my reasons why, but I'll just reiterate, it's because... It's because, yeah sure, you can break Sacred Stones by... Training everyone up to level 2020 in the Tower of Balmy, but at least you need to put in a little bit of effort to do that. Whereas in Path of Radiance, you just have to just shuffle your bonus experience onto Titania or Marsha or someone like that, and the game is instantly broken. And that you just get naturally. Even if you don't complete the early game chapters all that quickly, you still end up with a massive amount of bonus experience by that point, so it's pretty easy to get over leveled in this one if you really want to. Then on easy mode, um, it's even easier, no pun intended, because that gives you just so much more experience. Which, like I said, is the main difference on easy mode, but some of the early bosses, I think, have different weapons on easy. Or slightly lower stats as well. And more poison. Okay, this is exactly the kind of situation that I was trying to avoid. I've got a bit of a roadblock here, but as long as I make sure to have someone in... The thing that worries me is whether attacking Ike will be a priority for him, because Ike's the lord. That's just not enough. I would kind of like Ike to take out both of those enemies, but I'll see if I have room to get racing in there. Probably don't even need to be using the Speedbring 4K, but it looks cool, I guess. And it's also, the name is also funny. Alright, now... There are a couple of mages up there. The boss does not move. I mean, he probably moves on Maniac, but he doesn't move here. Okay, if I move Race in there, Tominali will be able to attack him, but uh, 15 damage and, yep, resistance. Yeah, that's that's more than enough. Resistance to survive. Also, just had a thought. I'm pretty sure silence doesn't work on Raisin. Because even though his blessing ability technically works based on his magic stat, it doesn't really count as magic, so I don't think it seals that off. And his chanting abilities obviously don't get sealed by silence. That'd be kind of dumb if they did. I haven't actually mentioned it yet, but the way that warriors slump over when they're defeated, is, I always found that funny. It's like, slump. They just kind of pause for a second and just go, slump. In fact, you'll probably see it right here when this guy gets destroyed. Also, yeah, so there is a feral one over there, but I don't need to worry too much. And uh, once again, I'm doing 22 to a 44 HP warrior with a sword. Go for it, and slump. <laughs> I just always thought that was pretty funny. Okay, chest key, but I don't really need that because of Volk. I do need to watch out for that feral one also. Okay, that is a sniper. Its accuracy is pretty decent. Also, Lagoos have ridiculous accuracy, so... Soren might be in a bit of trouble if he goes there. So... 
Stefan's not quite healed. And you could crit Stefan, but uh, his defense isn't that high, but it's not really that low either. Alternatively, that is enough. Guess I could do that. And you can only reach all the way up there. So yeah, Meteor is useful for more things in this chapter. Goodbye, Feral One. Yeah, be very thankful that we don't fight any mages with that much magic and Meteor Tones, because if you did, then your Lagoos characters would be really vulnerable. I think I need to have... Yeah, I'm going to need to have Mist Heal... You're out of range of Stefan from there, really? Guess these walls count as extra spaces. Of course, after this chapter, we'll be getting a staff that doesn't need to worry about range at all, but you'll see what that is. And... Uh, okay, you're almost, um... ready to detransform. Here's one of those times where Smite will actually do something. Just make sure you don't accidentally select attack instead. And you'll have to shove at least one of these priests out of the way. But once Ike gets to the boss, we're pretty much done here. The boss does not last very well. Uh, does not last very long against sword users. Well, powerful sword users at least. Just need to make sure that you don't die. You're probably going to attack Racin anyway though. I think you're in a pretty good position. There are also these guys, they do move sometimes, so I'll need to be a bit careful there. If worse comes to worse, I might actually need to use my my bolting or meteor tones on the boss, but I'll do that after I've got all the chests. Also, I kind of. Uh, the other reason why I like to not do the cheap bolting and meteor method is because I like to show people how to actually get through the central priest block. Hey, you didn't go for racing. That makes sense, and I know that in Ready at Dawn, almost every boss won't attack herons. In fact, even some generic enemies are programmed not to attack herons in that game, but... Kind of interesting thing about this game, too, is that almost every boss has special boss points against Racin, but... Most of them just want to keep him and sell him or something like that, but... um. Others just say, I really... I mean, I mean, Homasa, the boss of Chapter 19, is actually pretty interesting in that regard, because if he fights Raisin, he says there's no grace in cutting down someone who can't wield a weapon, but I guess I have to do this. Speaking of that, there are actually, uh, there are actually special boss lines for almost every boss and Toronio. Even this guy, even though this guy is not technically from Dayan. In fact, his boss quote with Torino was pretty funny. He says something like, Look, I'm a coward and you're a traitor. Let's be friends. But, anyway, now as long as I get rid of this thief next turn, I don't need to worry about him looting one of the chests. In fact, he might be making my job easier for me. But... Torino has some pretty good lines, because most of the Dayan uh, commanders actually recognize him. And they yell at him for being a traitor. But his boss quote against the final boss is fantastic, which is a shame because Toronyu can't hurt the final boss, so... The final boss has a lot of special conversations, and their one with Jill is great too, but most characters can't hurt him, so they're all sort of pointless. In fact, the final boss's best conversation is with Raisin, and you obviously don't want him to attack Raisin at all, so that's pretty stupid. Let's get in position to grab those chests. Yeah, in fact, it'll make things easier on me if I let you loot one of the chests now, because that'll mean that next turn I can use a chest key on one chest and then Volk on the other chest, and I'll have that locked down. And this turn, I will use my chest key on this chest. Nosferatu, not useful for me because I'm not using rice. And you can go ahead and take a chest key and use that for this chest. So I've already got this side totally done. Spirit Dust, more stat boosters that I'll save until the end. In fact, my only magic user is pretty much going to ma cat magic on his own, most likely, so I might not even need those for later. Might be best to use them on Sora now, but... I don't know. I've actually completed this chapter with every enemy dead except the priest before. It's not that hard. And 
Warriors are equipping bow slump slightly differently, not nearly as quickly and awkwardly. Oh right, you're poisoned. Didn't realize that, but oh well. And you can't double things. Maybe... Okay, let's actually try something. You can't quite get into a good position. And Leth is going to untransform the moment that um, we get up there. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this boss doesn't move. In fact, before I do that, where's Mist? Yep, Mist is not um, currently occupied, so she can go ahead and heal this guy. This guy. Sorry, Mordecai. You've actually been pretty useful for us. You're not this guy. Okay, strength is at least kind of alright. There's really only one point in the game you really, really need Mist to fight something, and even then I find it doesn't matter most of the time, because that one enemy that you needed to fight is really, really dumb in terms of his AI. Found that out when I was recording certain footage from an earlier playthrough that I will be showing later on in this run. Actually, I had a lot of trouble recording that footage, so you'd better be thankful to me because, ugh, yeah, that was annoying. You'll see what I'm referring to much later on. Those stairs at the back look like there'll be more long-range tome or staff reinforcements coming out of there, but I don't think there are. Okay, if I put Leth there, he is going to attack her. I'm okay. Actually, no, wait. I kind of want to see the boss's quote with Ike when I actually fight him with Ike. This is a pretty good quote. Pointless ether, but oh well. So yeah, this chapter is... Once you know the gimmick to it, it's really not all that bad. But it's a pretty weird chapter. I still feel like... And and the reason... like The real reason why I think this chapter is weird, you'll be seeing when it ends. Because let's just say that we're about to get some really, really major plot dumps after this chapter is over, and they're completely irrelevant to this bandit priest pushing adventure it's just it's so strange because oh yeah also these priests will heal the enemies so that's annoying because obviously the developers were like okay we need Ike to get to Palmeni Temple we need him to do one thing at Palmeni Temple in particular but that doesn't really involve fighting so what can we have happen here oh how about a bunch of random mercenaries take some priests hostage and you have to push the priests out of the way to get to them? So yeah, let's just have a fun, rompy filler chapter. It's it's just... It's kind of a weird time for a filler chapter. Like I said, it might be comic relief considering how heavy some of the earlier chapters in the day and art got, but also another Tomahawk is much appreciated. And here we have Silver Bow, which I won't be using. Some people have thought it was weird that I don't actually have a single, um... Okay, if I position just right, both of these enemies should die on this enemy phase, but it will mean that I need to take an extra turn to finish the chapter. But I'm actually okay with that. I'm still gonna get maximum bonus experience, believe it or not. They're very generous with turn limits later in the game. Transformed. However, yes, Mordecai can in fact finish you off, though I might need to heal him. There's a TV trope called Bizarro Episode, and I've always considered Solo to be this game's Bizarro Episode. But for slightly different reasons than normal, most of the time Bizarro Episodes are totally filler, but in this case, the gameplay here is completely filler, but the story is definitely not filler, which is part of why I just realized I need to stop you or you might be fleeing the map, and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is I'm actually going to have to meteor you. So, another good reason why Soren has to see ranking fire. Meteor is, well, meteor and uh, 
bolting are both really helpful here. And I have a second bolting tome, and I also have, um... Actually, I should have convoyed her knife and taken the second bolting tome, I should have just realised. We've still got quite a few more chapters with this song playing, and that's fine by me. The next map theme is alright, but I like this one better. And just a sneak preview of fighting the... Yeah, I need to weaken you first with someone else. And for that to happen, I'm gonna need to... 15 speed, 18 speed, and... If she gets critical, that could be not good. So... Hmm... But I can do some shoving next turn, I guess. Or I could, in fact... Shove with Mordecai now, or actually just simply park Mordecai right in front of this guy and have him attack Mordecai on the enemy phase. Don't think Mordecai's at any risk of dying here. Let me just see. Oh, no, but he definitely is. Right, yeah, that's not good. You get doubled even without the demi band, actually. Hmm. Oh, using a Lagoon Stone here feels like a bit of a waste, actually. Oh, right, no, of course, I could just bolting the boss and then attack with Ike. That's what I did in my practice run. Why didn't I, well, my sort of practice run. Uh, I said that I don't really practice these chapters. But why didn't I think of that before? So for now, waiting here mostly because I just want both of these enemies gone. And yeah, these bishops will attack you. I guess one thing that I could bring up here, so you'll notice that as I hold down the A button here, enemies move really fast, and you move really fast um, if I, you hold down the A button while you're moving a character, or like while the character is walking. This feature is actually only unlocked on a second playthrough or higher, and the weird thing is, I went back and just, because I was having to record footage for the, um, the skills video, so I had to go back to my very first epilogue file, which has lethality on Volk, that was the only way I could show that. So, I went to that epilogue file and recorded from it, and, uh, and went into the trial maps to sort of show off, um, to attempt to get Volk to use lethality. And the weird thing is, since that's still a first playthrough file, there goes poison, when I moved a character, they would, for example, I'd have to sit through this entire slow walking animation. Even if I held down A, it wouldn't go faster like that, and that's because you can't actually speed up walking animations on a first playthrough, even if you've completed that first playthrough and are using that epilogue file for trial maps. It's kind of strange, but that's just how it works. No, don't do that, that's stupid. Alternatively... Let's see, if everything goes right, this guy should die this turn, so... I can get him from there, just in case something goes wrong. He's still equipping his regular axe, so that means no, um... You know, for a second I just thought, oh, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and attack this guy through the wall and get experience. No, that's a priest. You do not want to kill any priests. You can see here there's 21 priests, so 20 including Tominami, and the only one left of the enemies is the boss, so let's just finish him off now. Huh, Kalil doesn't double, that's... I think even a crit won't kill there. There are healing priests standing right next to him, so, well, I guess we're about to find out if a crit's enough. It was. And here's this infamous death quote, obligatory mention of the fact that in the Japanese version, this boss's death quote was just GWAR. Just that. So all the rest of it was entirely localization added. They clearly wanted to make this guy kind of black comedy, comic relief after all of the earlier chapters. 
and annoyingly I didn't get to show his boss conversation with Ike, but it's, it's, it's basically he says, how many priests did you have to kill to get here? One, two, five? They're pretty scrawny. I bet you could take many of them without breaking a sweat. And then Ike's like, you coward, time to die. So there's a few variations on this ending scene, depending on how many of the priests survived. Obviously, Tomonami isn't here, it's just a generic priest if Tomonami got killed, which is what happened in my first playthrough. But looking at the script files, there's actually a variation of this scene for if all the priests died. I don't know what, like, you would never get that without actually trying, but there's actually extra dialogue here that plays if you killed all of them. And Ike's just like, we weren't able to save even a single priest. Um, what are you talking about? You yourself killed all of them. But anyway, we're about to get some very, very major story scenes here that are not related to this chapter at all. But I like Alintia's speech here. And I like Tom and Ami for showing that there are, again, more sympathetic Dayans. Now, technically he shouldn't know she exists because he wasn't the ruler of a nation, but I guess word has spread of her at this point, and word probably spread of how the day and I was looking for her, so that's probably why he was like, thank goodness you're well. And this you only get if all of the priests survived. So that's why I did this. Well, that and they're also worth a lot of bonus experience. We get the, the Asherah Staff. This is pretty much typical for s rank Staffs. Full heal to your entire army, regardless of where they are on the map. It has infinite range, fully heals everyone, and restores all their conditions. It's also s rank, so you won't be able to use it for a little while, but pretty good to have in the final chapter as a panic button. And time for Mood Whiplash, because now it's time for more heavy plot dumps. And yeah, Ike just acts as if that whole priest-pushing adventure never happened. So yeah, the gameplay of this chapter is pure filler, but the story is really, really not. And that's what makes it really weird to me. Someone I think was talking about this in the comments as well, but um, I had to clarify this, that ancient language is used not just by herons, it's used by some spellcasters as well. In fact, even up until Awakening, if you look very closely at the animations for some of the spells in Awakening, they use the ancient language script from Path of Radiance. It doesn't actually mean anything though, I don't think anyone's been able to decipher the characters and it's probably just complete gibberish. Though, what raises interesting implications is Valflame has that, and that's a, that's a spell from Fire Emblem 4, which would imply interesting things about the timeline if that was true. But yeah, this is why spellcasters do know a little bit of ancient language, but only enough to cast spells, so they aren't able to translate full sentences. Good thing we have someone who speaks the language here. But to have this much ancient writing on the walls of a place like this... And that person is probably a heron because no one else knows the ancient language that well. Yeah, it was a feather under the bed, of course it was.
Raisin's actually kind of the master of having siblings that he doesn't tell anyone about. Because he actually has another sibling that we don't know about yet. I find this interesting, just the fact that they were able to become friends despite the fact that they couldn't understand each other. Just, I can just imagine how that would have gradually happened and just how they would have learned to communicate without words. And it's just interesting to think about. So it's all coming together. Now we know why Mist had the medallion. So it's finally time for Ike to confess what he knows. Though, how did Alencia know about the Dark God earlier? Unfortunately... And that was the whole if Grail was ever slain by his pursuers thing that Volk mentioned. I wonder if Titania knew Volk. She probably did, but didn't say anything back there. 
And yeah, it was implied from an earlier conversation that Grail must have told Titania about this too, given how she reacted when the medallion got stolen. This is something interesting that I often forget, but Titania doesn't know. Ike never actually told her that he was there to directly witness Grail dying. And if you've seen her A support with Ike, you'll know why Titania had that outburst there. Yeah, getting to Ashnard will pretty much kill three birds with one stone. All of our objectives involve defeating him somehow. Now this is kind of interesting because we didn't say anything about the assassination of the former apostle here. Lilia just happened to get kidnapped on the night that happened, but... Could be connected, it could not. There are some details that we don't yet know here. All we do know is there's some big conspiracy going on. And someone is masterminding everything. At the moment, the most likely candidate is Ashnard. And here, that's the maximum bonus experience that you get for all the priests surviving. So, like I said, solo. Very, very bizarre chapter. The actual gameplay of it is completely filler, but the story reveals are really huge, not just for this game, but for Radiant Dawn as well, so you will really want to remember that scene at the end. Certain details in it that I don't want to go into directly because of spoilers, but there's a few very specific things that get brought up there that will become very, very important in the future. But, for now, we just have to march on. Our next destination is Crimea. And finally, next chapter, we finally, finally get to make a certain someone pay. Someone who we have been waiting to fight for a very long time.